Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life Real Crime Daily for Thursday, Thursday, May the 16th, 2024, and I'm your host, Woody Overton. And, y'all, I forgot uh, to tell you last time when I was recording by myself uh, that I'm recording in a new location, so if the sound quality isn't uh, what it normally is, it, it, it's not Jim Chapman's fault. Our Envision Pack podcast studios has Woody Overton's uh, not being too technical on the mic's fault. But anyway, Thirsty Thursday in at 136 Third Street, downtown Baton Rouge, Louisiana, O'Hara's Irish Pub, where the saying is, welcome home. Y'all go down there and drink the coldest beer in the state of Louisiana or get you a shot of whatever you like. Brian Ott, um, my best buddy that owns the basin where we do the crew bashes at, also has now opened O'Hara's Irish Pub, and I will be there this Saturday night guaranteed. And y'all come down and have a beer with me. Uh, If you go in and I'm not there, they open at 3 p.m. daily. Let them know you're a lifer. You'll get taken care of, I promise you. All right. And the grand opening will probably be the week after, but it is open. But, you know, when Brian does the grand opening, he doesn't do anything half assed. It's going to be a major blowout. And of course, we'll be there for that also. But the rolling solo again on the daily show. And let's get down to some true crime time for Thirsty. Thursday. Now, you know, I would expect that most of all of us went to prom back in our day, right? And I can remember the build up for it. And even though my high school was a small school, the you know the decorating committees, and you had to ask your whoever it was you were getting for your prom date, and I always wore the most fucking outrageous tuxedo I could find. <laughs> I wanted to. Uh, um, a tuck shop off of Thomas Delpit in the heart of uh, downtown Baton Rouge. I wouldn't go down there now in, a, in an armored car, but the I would I would all I would I might find some pictures from back then and post some of the outrageous shit that I wore. But you know, prom is a big deal, right? And then of course the after party, and we had it at my parents' house one year, and I got in trouble. But I won't tell you what for. And uh, my dad busted me. But the prom's big shit, right? Big time. And probably a lot of babies get made on prom, and I get a lot of virginities get lost on both sides, male and female. And a lot, in my case, a lot of alcohol was consumed, right? Uh, supposed to be the best time. When law enforcement, the especially in uniform patrol, not so much as a, a detective, but it was also you were guaranteed somebody was going to die. And usually it was in a car wreck from, you know, kids drinking and driving and, and doing whatever, and just a horrible thing, right, to have to go tell parents that their children are dead. Uh, so, you know, it's one thing to have to go tell a parent their child is dead because they died in a car crash. It's another totally different thing to do what I'm the story I'm about to read you and our hearts go out to um, the victims in this it's just horrible but a teenager was in police custody on a first degree murder charge after a high school senior was shot dead early Sunday at a party following a prom as according to the police y'all I mean, and this happened uh, this article came out on April 22nd 2024 so the, and again, this is by, oh, I should have told you, this by NBC News. I read it. And I just, it is the prom season, so I think it's relevant. So Arkansas State Police confirmed that Denetrius Stevens, 19, was arrested Sunday afternoon, hours after Lorenzo Harrison the third, 18, was fatally shot in the town of Helena, West Hel- Helena. The town on the banks of the Mississippi River is about 50 miles southwest of Memphis, Tennessee. 
uh, the Helena, West Helena School District administration said in a statement that Harrison's death was a tragic loss. The suspect will also be charged with possession of firearms by certain persons, police said. And yeah, I'm guessing that um, maybe he had a, a criminal history uh, um, in Louisiana. That's a 1495E possession of firearm uh, by a felon. But the shooting took place at an off-campus party following a prom attended by students of Helena, West, West Helena Central High School. Now, look, I'm not repeating that. That's the name of the town, Helena, West Helena. Central High School in Stevens is a former student at the school, police said. So I guess he wants to go back to prom. Um, earlier Sunday, police identified Stevens as a suspect and said in a statement that he would be charged with first-degree murder in possession of firearms. The Phillips County Sheriff's Office requested assistance after it received an emergency call about 1 a.m. Sunday. Police said the party was held opposite the ATR warehouse on Highway 49 heading, out of, uh, heading west out of Helena. Harrison's body uh, was taken to the Arkansas State Crime Lab for an autopsy in the Helena West, west State <laughs> fucking me up. The Helena West Helena School District administration said on its website, our hearts ache for the tragic loss of our beloved 12th grade student at Central High School and our deepest sympathies extend to his grieving family, classmates, friends, and our entire school community impacted by this senseless act of violence. And I agree with him. It's just stupid, stupid, stupid. The, um, <sighs> I don't know, but the, the, the school administration said, uh, together, may we honor his memory and work towards healing the wounds inflicted by this tragedy. And I guess, you know, I don't, I don't know any more details, y'all, the, but, you know, it's prom season. Um, it's supposed to be the best time. I mean, I certainly had to have a lot of good times. And can't really throw shade on the 19 year old going back for a prom because I know some younger girls asked me after I had graduated from high school and I, I did go to a couple of high school proms uh, uh, but I wasn't bringing a fucking pistol and I wasn't shooting someone so our hearts go out to you know the victim and their family and all that and hopefully if you have kids that are of that age tell them to be safe this prom season right so talking about having kids, I didn't drop an episode for Monday or last Friday with my voice on it. That mm, that's not true. I didn't drop an episode that was fresh with my voice on it. If I had, I would have wished all you moms out there the happiest of Mother's Day. Right. And you, you get it done every day, day in, day out, raising those babies all the way up, you know, through everything, ball games and good times, bad times, proms and everything else. So happy belated Mother's Day. I got to see my mom and bring her some good stuff to eat. And we got to hang out with uh, Cindy and, and the kids here at the house and all that. So I hope you had a, a great, great Mother's Day. And I really hope it was better than this next story from Fox News. It's horrible. It's uh, a Mother's Day massacre left a woman and two of her daughters dead in Mississippi. The suspect died later hundreds of miles away. Now, according to the Ridgeland Police Department, and y'all, if I'm not mistaken, I've stayed there. That's just north of Jackson, Mississippi. Pretty affluent area. Uh, but according to the original police department, a man later identified as Ivory James Welch III was the lead suspect in the death of his mother and two sisters when he fled town and the state, getting as far as Arizona. Uh, That's a long fucking drive because I've done it. Before he was shot dead in a shootout with state troopers. Now, Ridgeland Police Chief Brian Myers says officers received a call about the triple homicide around 3.30 p.m. Sunday at a home on Old Canton Road in Ridgeland. 
The identified victims were Ida Thomas Welch, who was 76 years old, y'all. Vicki Renee Welch, who was 56 years old, and Crystal Lynn Welch, who was 42 years old. And they said that this horrific event will have a lasting effect on this family. And the officers involved in this investigation, as well as our brothers in Arizona law enforcement, that's what the original police chief said. The Mississippi, Mississippi officers were notified that their suspect was killed in Arizona on Monday afternoon. So this dude was shitting and getting, because that's, I mean, I'm telling you, I've driven all the way to San Diego and from Louisiana. That's a long ways in Ridgeland. It's like another 110 miles from where I'm at. Uh, so I guess he drove straight through. But according to the police chief, an arrest warrant for Welch was obtained in the U.S. Marshals Task Force. That's my boys. They they always get their man, uh, or they always get them when, when I needed them. So the U.S. Marshals Task Force began searching for him. He was ultimately located by Arizona Department of Public Safety Troopers between more, more and see mm, the, I don't know, M-O-R-E-N-C-I in Clifton. I, I need OG lifer uh, Cheryl Reed to, to, to tell me how to say these Arizona names. That's where she's from. Uh, but officers from the Greenlee County Sheriff's Office in the Clifton Police Department assisted in the Arizona pursuit. Once found by the law enforcement officers, a gunfight ensued, and Arizona State Troopers attempted to apprehend Welch, and he fired upon the troopers and was fatally wounded in the gunfight. Fuck him. The Myers uh, added, this investigation is a great example of how teamwork and law enforcement, as well as a great relationship where our media outlets afford a swift justice for grieving family. Now, the Mississippi ACLU released a statement remembering Crystal Welch, who served as board president since 2023. I just cannot process today's news, Executive Director Jarvis Dort said. Crystal was a great friend, and since 2023, she was an enthusiastic leader of the ACLU of Mississippi Board of Directors. She was always asking what more she could do to support our team and our work. And our staff and board will fit ever be grateful for her commitment to equality and justice, her passion for life, infectious spirit, and, th and enthusiasm will be missed. Wow. The, uh, I don't know, it's tough. The, anyway, it goes on. On behalf of the ACLU of Mississippi, I would like to express our heartfelt condolences to Crystal's family during this unthinkable time. Well, it's Crystal and our whole family, basically. And the, we urge the community to join us in sending prayers to the Watts family. Crystal was just a true delight. She was just a superwoman. She was fun, loving, intellectual, very passionate about her work. Now, authorities, yeah, they don't uh, have a motive for the fatal shooting, y'all. They said he may have been upset about a funeral and his birthday, which was on Friday. Wow, can you imagine? All right, Mother's Day, and shit, it's not like you're the 19 year old, like the kid in the first story, right? The Mother's Day, you kill your own mom and then your two sisters. Fucking, well, you know what? Again, you have heard me say it once, you hear me say it a thousand times. I believe the fires of hell burn a little bit brighter when this shit bag came through. Um, you know, they talk about Crystal uh, Welch. She was the 42-year-old y'all. Um, but Miss Ida, Miss Ida, think about that. She's 76. She raised all these babies, including this piece of shit. I'm not going to say his name again. And uh, I have his picture. Um, yeah, the... So when it, you turn it over, you get a warrant or something like that. Obviously, it's, it's as serious as, as it can get unless there's murdered children involved. And you turn it over to U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. They automatically will do a bolo on the vehicle. And now, because of, uh, oh, God, what was the little girl's name? 
Amber, the Amber Alert system. They can, they don't just do it for missing kids. They can post, and you've seen it, I'm sure, driving through like Texas and different states where they have the billboards and say, be on the lookout for this vehicle, call 911, armed and dangerous. But the more, probably more importantly, the they will have, they'll track down the U.S. Marshal Task Force. They're experts at it. They'll track down every credit card, every access this guy had to money. And um, the problem with that is it used to be if, if you ran your credit card at a gas station, it would take the credit cards companies a week to get back with you. But now I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that. That was 20 years ago. So I'm pretty sure it's probably instantaneous now, but it is a good example of they had first of all they had to figure out what direction he was going and then they were tracking him and broadcasting it to all the agencies and, and the shit bag is the reason why you want to warn your brothers and sisters in law enforcement hey this bad dude's coming your way and if you see him mm, yeah we got a first degree murder warrant times three on him but he if he killed his own mama he'll certainly kill you be safe, right? But help, help us get the 1015. Help us get this arrest. And they did it. Well, it wasn't an arrest. But the, the definitely wasn't an arrest, but hell or jail doesn't matter. And I guess they say the taxpayers a lot of money. And I mean, he got better than what he gave his own mama and his siblings. So I don't know. All right. Let's go to Tennessee. And y'all, I don't know if you know that. I think I mentioned it several times. I lived in Tennessee. And so uh, two different parts of Tennessee, and I loved it. I absolutely love the people. I love the, mm, back then it was the party and and the, the just the culture of it, right? It's it good people. Uh, mm, I wouldn't love these people in Tennessee so much, so. So I'm going to take you to another story, and this is from Fox News. They say authorities in Tennessee confirmed that five people were arrested over the weekend on multiple charges in connection to an attempted murder that occurred in August of 2023. So it goes back for a minute, right? That this attack left the victim with a skull fracture, and um, guess what, y'all? The skull fracture was caused by baseball bat in a skillet who in the fuck brings a baseball bat in a skillet to a fight baseball bat i can understand the i mean if you have one in your car and you get out and you're defending yourself or something but a skillet a cast iron skillet that shows intent but the carter county sheriff's office announced that the charges against the five suspects stem from an investigation into an incident on august the 19th of 2023 when deputies responded to a report of an assault where a 29-year-old victim was suffering from an apparent head injury, you think? Deputies stated the male victim was unable to speak with them at the time due to the severity of his injuries, meaning he was knocked out, and that he was transported to an area for hospital treatment. During the investigation, deputies said they spoke to members of the victim's family who stated they had received a call from the victim who sounded like he was in distress, and he asked them to come help him. The victim's mother told deputies the victim stated he had been attacked by several subjects and stated, now listen to this shit, and stated they used a baseball bat, brass knuckles, and a cast iron skillet to assault him. Let's talk about it. The I don't know what y'all cook with in the rest of the country, but down here, we the cast iron skillet, Big, heavy black motherfuckers that you you don't even wash them with soap every time you get done. You clean them, but then you have to re-oil them down. And you season them, right? I have never picked up a, a, a cast iron skillet that didn't weigh less than seven or eight pounds. But brass knuckles? Dude, they, they're illegal. They're illegal. You're not even supposed to. I mean, that legal like a switchblade. You're not supposed to have them. You know why? Because they're made to fucking kill somebody or maim somebody. And they did it in this case. So the family members also provided deputies with the names of the individuals that the victim identified as the people who attacked him. Deputy responded to the boat ramp where the incident took place and stated that they located the victim's vehicle and discovered a puddle of blood 
in a broken cast iron skillet next to the vehicle. Okay. I, I don't understand that because every cast iron skillet I ever touch is one solid piece of metal, right? I mean, how in the fucking hard do you have to hit someone to break an iron handle that's, I mean, it's not these, well, maybe it was a cheap one. The ones I used, they're all, it's all welded together. Um, but after processing the scene, deputies were informed by medical staff that the victim had suffered a skull, skull fracture. In... Earlier this month, the Carter County Grand Jury returned indictments charging the following five individuals in connection with the case. Jerry A. Jerry a. Carden, Jr., 33. Misha Brienne Williams, 32. Kelvin Lynn Bradley, Jr., 24. Daniel A. Sherrill, 19. Jeffrey Scott Brooks, Jr., uh, y'all, they got, got charges of conspiracy to commit second-degree murder, attempted second-degree murder, and ag assault with a weapon. 33 years old all the way to 21. Wow. So deputies arrested all five of them over the weekend and stated that they were all released from custody after their posting a $25,000 bond each. Well, you know, I had a head injury from a bottle to head and I had subdural hematomas and I had the brain bleed and all that shit. And it took forever for me to, uh, to recover the, I don't remember much of it, but, um, I guess this victim is now, I mean, of course he told the family, but I guess it could be hearsay or whatever, but evidently they've done a good job. The Carter County Sheriff's office in They'll get some justice for him. No, I don't know what the motive was, y'all. It was at a boat ramp. The, maybe, I don't know, maybe they got pissed off about having to wait in line or something. Fuck, I don't know. There's no motive. But he show up with brass knuckles. Well, maybe that shows boat ramp because they're usually in a remote location. But brass knuckles, cast iron skillet, a baseball bat. Hmm. Well, I don't know. That's crazy, but you know what? Let's stay in the great state of Tennessee. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts that spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered a super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. In common, like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses, and many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., they have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble Meal Kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. 
Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, ciapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something. All the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real. We've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door. So see what a difference Gobble will make for your household. Right now, they're offering my listeners a fantastic limited time deal. You get $120 off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin-baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you never had. And now this, I don't do these in order um, on purpose, y'all. This is how I, you know, how I have them when I research them. So Fox News again. And well, y'all, I'm, I'm giving you, when I say Fox News or Missy News, that's where I found the story out. And of course, I'm going to interject my own stuff on them. So uh, Fox News reports a Tennessee couple found transporting millions of dollars worth of cocaine was killed in Texas on Thursday during a traffic stop shootout with law enforcement. Edward and Elizabeth Stevenson were first identified through undercover buys of illegal drugs, which is that this according to the Putnam County Sheriff's office. They said this on Monday, the undercover work, Okay, so undercover bias. That's not that's not the name of the task force, y'all. They obviously the they had undercover agents go in and buy a significant amount of dope from these people. And usually, when we we would do it, we would do it numerous times because the more buys you can get from them, confirmed buys. Like if I didn't use the CI to do it, if I went undercover, I did it. I'd go in and buy a hundred dollars worth of meth. I'd bring it out for chain of custody immediately, put it in, tag it, bag it stick it up and I wait a couple of days and I call hey man can I get some more of that shit and you know go undercover again and do it the more times you can do it and get away with it meaning well yeah but I'm not getting busted by the bad guys the, the, uh, the more you have for when you make the warrants for the rest each each time you they sell to you is a different charge right so that's what happened here and so they, they did undercover buys and uh, they identified Edward and Elizabeth Stevenson, right? So after they did the buys, the, the undercover work allowed investigators to get a search warrant for the Stevenson home, where the detectives uncovered nearly a pound of suspected methamphetamine, suspected fentanyl, multiple firearms, body armor, and ammunition on Thursday. That's what the sheriff's office said. Now, during the search, detectives learned that the Stevensons were driving a semi-truck through Texas with the illegal drugs, and they were armed, right? So both Edward and Elizabeth had made previous statements that they would die by suicide by cop if law enforcement uh, attempted to stop them. Now, y'all, let's... You know what? I don't even want to tell the stories. I got a story I can tell about that where, I, you know, suicide by cop is a very real thing. They want to go out with guns a-blazing. Um, these idiots are just idiots. But, you know, a lot of times when that happens, it's uh, when I was witness to it, it was a domestic violence situation, and the people may have been high or not high, but a lot of times it's, it's a mental health issue that's involved 
these Edward and Elizabeth were just assholes. So, I mean, they made it known, hey, cops pull us over, we're going guns a blazing. And guess what? Well, when the detectives were doing search warrants, et cetera, they immediately alerted the Donnelly County Sheriff's Office in Texas and the Texas Department of Public Safety about the couple. That's Texas DPS, y'all, in Louisiana. That's the state police, same thing. So when deputies in Donnelly County tried to pull over the semi-truck, the couple continued to drive for several miles before coming to a stop. Well, I can guarantee you they're locking and loading on both sides. They, they, um, they were like, mm, I love you, baby. Load up, let's kill these motherfuckers, right? And then the cops that are chasing them know that they are armed and dangerous. But Edward and Elizabeth then exited the vehicle, and guess what? They opened fire on the deputies and the troopers. The Stevensons were killed in the ensuing shootout. Good for them. Uh, you know, people watch gunplay or whatever. You watch too many fucking movies and shit. You think it's just easy. There's a reason that our military and there's a reason that our cops train with their firearms. Um, and especially like on SWAT and stuff, you'll do a lot of physical exertion, like run the obstacle course or whatever shit before you start to fire and um, on your targets to practice or qualify. And they do that because they want to get their heart rates up. Like you think these cops following the semis, uh, heart rates weren't up. They know they're, they're armed and dangerous, right? And they know they're not stopping and they're not, not stopping for a reason. So when they, their heartbeats are already jacked up. There's no m amount of physical training in the or obstacles course in this world that you can do to get your heart rate up like that. And when you know somebody's getting out and they're going to be shooting at you, right? But advantage to the police, advantage to law enforcement. And that's why you trained. It, it, you know, you're never going to get the same heart rate that you know when, when these assholes are going to bail out and start shooting at you but you can get it close and guess what you got a lot more training than they do and when your heart rate's up it's harder to hit your target and stuff like that so yeah they went out by suicide by cop well, that just to me means in this case they lost a fucking shootout they weren't prepared but authorities searched the couple's vehicle and found now check this out after the shootout, they search the semi truck and they find 64 pounds of cocaine valued at $3.4 million. Mm, I, I think it's worth a whole lot more than that when they cut it down. Um, but the sheriff's office said the drugs appeared to be en route to Tennessee. Semi truck. If I was going to run dope, probably the way I'd do it. You don't see that many getting stopped, especially for narcotics. Uh, so they go to South Texas. They, you know, get their shit. Three point fucking four million. I guarantee you somebody was backing them. But let us let me read on. So Putnam County Sheriff Eddie Ferris blamed open border policies that are making it much easier for Mexican cartel members. I figured they had a backing and their associates to traffic illegal drugs into smaller uh, communities. Ferris said the cocaine seized from the Stevenson would likely have been mixed with fentanyl. There you go. Oh, that's fucked up. So if it's 3.4 million in cocaine, that's probably 20 million, y'all, with fentanyl mixed in, because fentanyl's cheap as fuck. But the sheriff thanked community members for calling in anonymous tips about the couple, and I'll wait. I always say this, y'all. Uh, the sheriff said, anytime you see anything you feel suspicious, please call us and we'll investigate it. That's what the sheriff Fair said. In this particular incident, it most likely saved lives. Well, I agree with him there. Shout out to um, those deputies and those troopers who ultimately, I mean, none of them got killed. That's a, that's a good day and they took these dirt bags off the street. Hey, that was their choice to die, suicide by cop. It's not like uh, those cops woke up that day and said, mm, let's just go find this uh, uh, truck and, you know, what the fuck, kill the people that were in it, right? 
So I don't know. The I'm gonna take you to pretty much my hometown, but it's definitely my home parish, but it's definitely a place that I spent about three years at. And it's a prison, Dixon Correctional Institute. And I'm going to give, uh, this was sent to me by Ms. Crefaro, and the it's actually was reported first by our dear friend, Karen Chala, Y'all go check out her podcast, Louisiana Unfiltered. She's awesome. Um, but so I'm I'm gonna kind of paraphrase from what she what she wrote, but I want you to understand um, my thoughts on this. But East Feliciana, and that's where I'm from. Five generations born and raised, and, and my parents still live there, et cetera. So in East Feliciana said. Multiple agencies spent several months investigating claims that tens of thousands of dollars worth of contraband were being smuggled in the Dixon Correctional Institute, or y'all, we know it as DCI. And I worked there from, ooh, God, I think 1990 to 93, something like that. And I was a correction officer, right? The, uh, the, it's a pretty big prison. They, it's not as big as Angola. Or y'all go check out Bloody Angola, the podcast, Jim Chapman ID. Um, it's probably the second, if not the third largest prison in the state of Louisiana. And I, you know, I tell a lot of stories about it over the years, et cetera. But Burl Kane was my warden, and he went on to be the uh, famous warden for Angola. And now he's head of the whole department the Mississippi Department of Corrections. But anyway, DCI is located in Jackson, Louisiana, which is, uh, like I told you, in East Feliciana Parish. Now, I'm from Clinton, which starts East Feliciana Parish if you're going east to west, and then Jackson would be the last town on the west side, uh, which ends with Thompson Creek before it turns into West Feliciana Parish, which is where Bloody Angola is at. So the... There's a lot in there's a lot in Jackson, a lot of state run facilities. There's DCI, then there's the um, hospital. I think it's anyway the forensic hospital for the, the mentally in, or insane. That's where they, you know, people that commit crimes, uh, they say they're insane or whatever. They ship them there to be evaluated, but they also house the ones that are legitimately insane, the criminally insane. They also have the War Vets Home, it's huge, it's a beautiful place. Um, they have the villa, the state-run geriatric home. Um, it's, it's all spread out through East Louisiana Parish, but ma- mainly surrounding um, Jackson. They also have the um, state mental hospital, the, the uh, I forget the, the official name of it, but it's huge, and it's in the heart of Jackson. But DCI is there. I mean, it's a major employer and everything else. Well, you know what? Department of Correction doesn't pay the best. Um, contraband gets into prisons because 99% of it gets in because free people or correctional officers or people that work in the prison bring it in. So let me tell you about this investigation that Karen Ch- uh, Chala report on so Dixon Correctional Institute, or DCI, is located in Jackson, L- Louisiana, in East Feliciana Parish. And it's why the East Feliciana Sheriff's Office, State Police, Department of Corrections, or DOC, and DCI investigators work together on the investigation that started in November of 2023. Um, let me touch on this. So naturally, the Sheriff's Office has its own investigators. And anything that happens at DCI, uh, they that's could be a crime that's prosecuted on the outside. The they're going to investigate it. But check this out: DCI has its own investigators, and they're the ones that are there every day, you know, taking tips from informants and and doing whatever, investigating inmate on inmate violence stuff like that. And then they they decide whether or not to call in the sheriff's office or make it an institutional charge. But the Department of Correction 
who is naturally was over DCI in all the prison. And my good buddy Joel, shout out to you, homie. He, I, I think he's a colonel over the DOC investigators now. And we go way back, and he'll be on the Real Life Real Crime original podcast one day. Uh, but anyway, they're all coming together. But you know why? I'm about to tell you because they got some shit going on now. When the when you find out or you suspect who's involved in this contraband rings, you don't just run up and grab them the first time, right? You might get the low fish, you flip them, you know, get you use them, and they build it up. But I guarantee you, when you bring in the state police, the Department of Corrections investigators, the DCI investigators, the sheriff's office investigators, everybody else, oh, it's going to be a big one. So check this out. Hey y'all, changing my wardrobe from summer to fall, it's never easy. Luckily, Quince offers timeless and high-quality items I adore, ensuring my wardrobe stays fresh and I don't blow my budget. And there's nothing easier than going to Quince and choosing these high-quality items, like cashmere sweaters from $50, pants for every occasion, washable silk tops, and so much more. The best part? All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes, and I love that. I got the stainless steel Link Apple Watch band for $59.90. It's heavy duty. It's awesome, and it's like $100 less than I could find anywhere else. And I also got a 100% organic Cotton Fisherman quarter zip-up sweater. The color is alabaster. Man, I can't wait to wear that this fall. And Cindy got the Mongolian cashmere boat neck sweater in Heather Gray. And I'm telling you, these are classic pieces at a fraction of the price. Make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high-quality closet essentials. Go to quince.com slash R-L-R-C for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash R-L-R-C to get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash R-L-R-C. You'll thank me later. Hey, ladies. Are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have hormone harmony a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of hormone harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. So the DOC investigators and DCI security seized several large bundles of contraband late last year. The bundles included large quantities of illegal narcotics, cell phones, and Narcotics were always there when I was here, y'all. Cell phones weren't an issue because they didn't fucking exist. Or the, the ones they were were so big, you weren't smuggling them in. But I can imagine doing time in prison, a cell phone would be the shit because you can have the internet and, and, uh, and phone and all that. So, yes, they're illegal. So, and they also see other forms of contraband. Now, Louisiana State Police say the joint investigation resulted in them identifying a large-scale contraband smuggling operation involving DCI inmates, naturally, trustees, and that's 
inmates who, are, you know, have access to certain areas and less supervision. Uh, go listen to Bloody Angola. Also, a DCI employee and several other civilian individuals from the Baton Rouge area. Now, y'all, the civilian individuals that did not have access to DCI, they would be the ones running the dope to, you know, search out the employees and all these other people. But officials say the nine people were working collectively to smuggle pounds, pounds of marijuana, pounds of methamphetamine, and large quantities of synthetic cannabinoids. That's some bad shit. It uh, makes you go crazy anyway. Heroin, cocaine, and hundreds of Suboxone strips. Hundreds of those, y'all, Suboxone is used in, uh, if you're getting off heroin that, that's, or pain pills or whatever. The, uh, that's what they use to, you take that, it's prescribed, you take that to help you stop from being so sick. Also, hundreds of dosage of units of prescription medication, probably I'm assuming Xanax, different things like that, along with numerous cell phones, chargers. That, I wonder where, I wonder, wonder whether they would charge cell phones in a prison without being seen. Uh, also, mobile Wi-Fi devices and knives into DCI. Fucking recipe for disaster. Investigators estimate the value of the items smuggled in the DCI by this group to be worth over $90,000. And state police did not release specifics of what the group was doing with the contraband once it was smuggled into the prison. Well, <laughs> stupid. They, that means they want to tell how long the case was going on for in case somebody accidentally overdosed or whatever, but I get it. Protect your investigation. Um, Louisiana State Police also did not provide details on each person's role with the lead smuggling. Well, and I tell you, uh, as Karen reports, the nine individuals have been arrested, okay, so far. That's Dwayne Blair, who's a DCI inmate. Bruce Padilla, a DCI inmate. Dustin Watson, a DCI employee. And now, all right, let's go back. On Blair and Padilla, uh, they were booked in the East Feliciana Parish Prison so that they would actually take them out of DCI, take them to the, the jail uh, in Clinton, and book them where they were waiting on, you know, they have to answer just like anyone else. Even though they have their time with the Department of Corrections, they have to go back to court for these street charges. The DCI employee, they fucked. Uh, um, Dustin Watson, he was charged with malfeasance in office, and that's only pretty much something that a cop can get or, or somebody with a public office in a position of trust. He's also charged with introduction of contraband with, and possession with intent to distribute a Schedule One controlled substance. Possession with intent to distribute a Schedule Two. Uh, PWITD Schedule Three and PWIT Schedule Four. Basically, Dustin Watson has been charged with every scheduled drug that's known. All the inmates are booked on the same charge, y'all. Uh, Aaron Johnson, same thing, inmate at DCI. Ernest Mills, another DCI inmate. Lernice Jackson, a civilian. Now, this one, uh, Lernice was booked into the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison for distribution of all these different things, right? Uh, and criminal conspiracy to commit introduction of common uh, contraband. So uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing the allegedly these these next civilians I'm telling you about were facilitating the drugs to these inmates and the employees that got it to them. Uh, Gerald Bowie, civilian, and booked in the East Feliciana Parish Prison, same charges, criminal conspiracy to commit introduction of contraband, blah, 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 blah. And Lauren Robinson, uh, but also booked in the East Feliciana Parish Prison, criminal conspiracy and introduction of contraband. So, you know, the case is ongoing, and there you have it. Uh, that's my place. I spent three years. I used to say I was doing time. And I know Karen North Carolina is listening, and, and she was the jail matron, parish prison matron, until she retired. And I, I say I was doing time. I, I, I'd go there 12 hours a day. Doors were locked behind me. 
the only difference between me and, and a convict was I got to go home after 12 hours. They let me out. But you're going back in. And when you're in there, it's a whole different world. Uh, smuggling in dope, mm, that's always going to happen. Cell phones, new, new to me, but I get it. The But the fucking, why would you smuggle in knives? The, the knives, I mean, everybody gets high, but the knives are for bad intentions. And they could be used... You're a real shitbag if you're a correction officer or employee of DCI and you help smuggle in knives because they could be used to take hostages. They could be used to kill other people that work there, much less the the inmates themselves. So you're a special brand of fuckstick if you smuggle any type of weapon. I mean, people are always going to smuggle dope, but you take the time to smuggle in a fucking knife Maybe it'll get used on you, right? We're not talking about prison shanks, but anyway, I'm gonna wrap this up this episode. Thirsty Thursday. Apologize if the sounds different. We get it. Jim will do the best that he can with it. And the again, O'Hara's pub officially open, you know. I, we got it it got delayed a couple times for whatever reason, red tape shut. In, but now it's open every day except for Monday. It opens at 3 p.m. Go have the coldest beer in Baton Rouge and be welcomed home. Um, you know, the best whiskey also. Oh, my God, they have a selection of whiskey like you wouldn't believe. And uh, it's a great, comfortable place. And go in there and you tell them to tell Brian I that you're a lifer. All right? And we'll hook you up. And I'm going to be there Saturday night, if not Friday night also. I might go down because it's um, Friday night downtown alive. You know, Third Street, it, it, the downtown, y'all, there's a police precinct uh, on the corner, a night, even a half a block away from O'Hara's. But it's like a, um, clean Bourbon Street. It's where all the tourists go and, and a lot of the locals, too. But the plenty of parking downtown, the, the, you know, what have you, safe, go to O'Hara's great place they got a lot of history there uh very pro cop friendly and that's it that i love and appreciate each and every one of y'all thank you for continuing to like and listen and share uh you will be getting an episode whether it's me you know whether it's just me or not you're going to be getting an episode until next time you host a real life real I'm not used to saying it by myself. Host of Real Life Real Crime Daily, Woody Overton. Until next time. Peace.